Hello and welcome back to the Do Brand You channel. It's great to have you back with us again. And today I have a very special guest. It's Laura Atkins. And we are going to dive into how she has, through the journey in her life, really been able to be and do the best version of herself. And she's got some really interesting, uh, I would say, passions and purpose in what she's doing today. So we're going to learn all about that. So welcome, Laura, to Do Brand You. Well, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. <laughs> That's great. So let me tell you a little bit about Laura before we get into a great conversation. So Laura is a children's book editor, author, and teacher, as well as the founder of the Manzanita Children's Book Community. She's worked in children's book world for almost 30 years and seven years in traditional children's book publishing. She's also a freelance editor, and she's worked with publishers and individuals. She's lived in England for 12 years, where she did her master's in children's literature and also taught within that master's program. And then she moved back to the United States in 2013. She found the courage to write herself, and she co-wrote first her first two books in the Fighting for Justice series, which I'm excited excited to learn more about today. And she is very passionate about diversity and equity in children's books. And I and she believes that everyone has a story to tell. She's doing what she can to open the door so that people can move away from publishing gatekeepers to tell their stories that they want to tell for themselves and their communities. So my goodness, let's get into this conversation. Here on the Do Brand You channel, Laura, we're really interested in people's journeys through their life and how they find their why and how they find their purpose. And And so can you take us back to that 30 years ago when you started getting into children's publishing and how this has evolved? Sure, sure. I mean, I might even have to go back further because <laughs> yeah. my passion for children's books really started when I was a kid. Um, mm. and engaging with stories in a, in a pretty big way um, mm. from when I was very young. So I, I read a lot and I loved especially fairy tales when I was a young kid. And then uh, I say especially, I read everything but like uh, fantasy and science fiction. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think I've been drawn not just to storytelling, but sort of these larger stories or these archetypal stories. Mm -hmm. um, which I think now are some of what kind of connect us all, you know, mm -hmm. across culture, across time and space. Um, and yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm still having this sort of evolving sense of like the power of stories, but I'd say, yeah, that, that was it. And then when I was in college, I was an English major, you know, just like, what do I do? I love books. Okay. I'll do that. Um, <laughs> but I was also, uh, an activist. That was a big part of my identity. Um, my family, my parents were in Berkeley in the sixties, you know, protesting in the streets and, um, kind of both sides have traditions of, of speaking up and standing up for people to try to make the world a better place. Um, so for me, that was a big thing, especially in high school and actually in junior high or middle school too, where, um, I was, pr I went to protests, I got arrested. I, you know, kind of anti-nuclear, anti-apartheid, like lots of just, you know, that was really a lot of my identity. Um, wow. And so when I graduated from college and was like trying to figure out next steps in career and floundering a bit, I, I remember feeling like that was a especially hard time just to like look at the big world and say, okay, now what am I going to do? Um, and I found out about this publisher called Children's Book Press that was a nonprofit publisher of mm -hmm. multicultural children's books is how they described it at the time. And they published a lot of bilingual books in many different languages. So there was a... A, a mission to the publisher of creating books that all children will relate to and enjoy. Um, so I, once I found that, I was like, bing, you know, it was, it was children's books, which, you know, was my passion. And then also this sort of idea of, of trying to make the world a better place, make sure all kids get to have books um, that reflect their lives. And mm. uh, it took me a little while to, to get in there, you know, as a small publisher and I, I applied for a couple of jobs, but by kind of being persistent about it, you know, first I had, I just wrote and said I was interested in an internship and I never got a reply to that. And then I applied for a 
this is, I think, a data type position. I was like, I'll just apply to anything to work here. And I didn't get that. But then one of the women who was involved in the hiring process then remembered me. And when an editorial assistant position opened up, uh, she called me. Wow. uh, So that's how I started. That is so cool. There's so many things that you've said here uh, that I'm curious about. One of the things that you mentioned is that you read a lot as a child. And so you went right back to that. And in in the working that I do with people who are trying to find like their why, their purpose, what is what what do they want to do? I always encourage them to go back to playing like a child. You know, I, I think it's so special when we hear stories like yours, where we we clearly see that 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 passion that you have now was rooted back in your childhood. So amazing. Mm. Yeah. I'm curious as well with this whole concept of con- uh, connecting across cultures in time and space in regards to uh, children's books. And for example, you talked about uh, w- working with those people, publishing um, books to try to to make the world a better place, connecting children so that they all have a story that they can relate to. Can you dive into that a little bit? Uh, because there's so many people here on the channel that have a multicultural background. They have they have cultural connections in different countries. And how do, how do you connect children's literature? How does that work? <laughs> Boy, there's so many so many ways to go with that. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, just even thinking about books and stories for kids, right? Books are one avenue that stories get to kids, but you can get them in a lot of different ways. I know just from my own experience, how formative the experience of kind of taking in stories was like, I am who I am because of the stories that I heard and books that I read. Um, You know, I think that's how we all make meaning, right? Mm -hmm. We tell each other stories. We tell ourselves stories, like everything around us is is a kind of a story that makes meaning. Um, And you know, as I went along, you know, I did my own reading, which, like I said, was a lot of fairy tale, fantasy, science fiction. I, I realized later my early reading tended to be pretty um, white, Western European homogenous in a way. Um, yeah. That opened up some when I went to college. It was, you know, especially I took Spanish, so I was reading books from Latin America. And, um, but really, when I got involved in publishing, is when I started to understand how culturally constructed story and how we tell stories are or is. Um, And I realized that a lot as an editor, as a white woman who was, you know, getting submissions from primarily BIPOC people um, from different kind of backgrounds. And it was a sort of a slow learning curve for me. You know, when you're in publishing, at least in my experience, there's not really a lot of training about, Mm -hmm you know, how do you find a good book or how do you, you know, it's sort of, you learn on the job. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And what I started to realize was I had certain ideas of what a story was or how you were supposed to tell a story um, that were culturally constructed. So for instance, I I was an editor at Lee and Low Books in New York, which was another publisher of diverse children's books. And um, I was, I put out a call for submissions for native American entries And I had uh, a a woman who'd written adult books for adults send in a story and I rejected it somewhat, I'd say blithely, (laughs) where I sent what would be a kind of typical rejection letter, um, which I said, oh, here at Lee and Lowe, we don't publish fantasy um, because this book had a a boy who developed a conversational relationship with a rock. Um, It was a contemporary story. And she wrote back and said, well, in my culture, this isn't considered fantasy. Um, wow. and so that was, you know, one of various moments where I realized, wow, I'm really bringing, you know, my own sense of this. And then within the publishing world, there's all kinds of different layers of sort of institutional, what is story and what are the kinds of books we want to publish? Um, so I guess I feel like for me, I started to reflect on, okay, my sense of story has come very much from what I've read and what I've been taught. Like, how do you tell a story? Three act structure, you know, even the power of threes, right? Partition of threes. I read a an article by Cynthia Lytic Smith, who's a Native American um, author who wrote about how in her cultural traditions, it tends to be repetition of four, 
right? And just these kind of things that I think right easy when you grow up in a in a context where you know everything gets reinforced. And, you know, to not realize, oh, actually, this isn't how it's done. This isn't objectively right. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of it for me has been personally about kind of humility <laughs> and recognition that sort of the systems that are in place kind of elevate certain ways of telling stories um, mm. in, you know, like in the United States context, let's say, or I lived in England for a while. Um, so I think I yeah. became much more curious and open and passionate about wanting to help people tell stories that don't have to go through that gatekeeping that happens in traditional publishing. Right. Um, right. That is so, that is so interesting. I'm, I'm so intrigued by this because you, you know, you talk about the different ways that stories are seen. I love that, that, you know, a boy talking to a rock is, it's not fantasy to us, you know, and mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, I the one of the reasons that I do this podcast is because I want to have conversations with people around the world because it's how I learn. You know, I, I'm already learned so much already just in our short conversation from you. And I think that's the wonderful thing is if we could get these kinds of books into like libraries and schools so that children had access to them. Before I get you to just maybe talk a little bit about how we can do that, uh, people that do follow the channel know that I wrote a book with my daughter and, and, and her finding her identity of growing up in Dubai, being an American and a New Zealander, and then coming to New Zealand. And she talks about things which I never understood until she was 20. I didn't understand how her her identity was forming because what I now understand is that children absorb and they don't they don't try to analyze it until later in life. So she like for example, she came here to New Zealand when she was 12. We brought her here so they could grow up in a country that they brought had citizenship to. She felt a grief which we titled the chapter she felt a loss, but she couldn't identify it. She didn't know what it was. And what it was, was that she missed the sound of the mosque that she grew up with all the time. That was a very comforting noise to her. And the thing is, so now she's thrust into a school system here, which even in the South Island here in New Zealand, uh, there's a lot of different cultures here. But then as she goes to school, there's no books that resonate with her life that she had hmm. and so that's kind of what I'm really curious about is that you are into the publishing but also with publishing is how are you able to get these st stories out or what are the challenges to getting these stories into communities where there can be you know you know a diversity of books are available to children mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, first, I, I kind of love that story you just told because it shows the complexity of even mm. what identity is, right? Yeah. And I love that for your daughter, like growing up with, you know, the mosque and the sounds and everything around her that, you know, that was mm. her norm, right? And, yeah. and she may have not looked like that. And yet it was part of what she carried because it's what she'd grown up with, like what people would expect typically yeah. of someone yeah. from Dubai, which I think speaks to the complexity of this conversation. Yes. Right about you know what is identity, um, yeah, and then within the kind of power system structures and different contexts, yeah, you know, yeah. locally and then and on broader, you know, more internationally. Um, yeah. So I can speak mostly to the U.S. and yeah. some to the U.K. Those are my kind of experiences with those. Um, sure. And I worked, yeah, I worked for three publishers in the United States and I left Lee and Lowe in 2001. So okay. it's been a while since I've worked in traditional publishing. And then right. since then I've been freelance, I have worked with quite a few publishers, mostly small publishers um, over the years as a freelance editor. Um, mm -hmm. One of the publishers I've done a lot of work for is actually a Nigerian publisher called Cassava Republic Press. Um, okay. And then one of the more recent projects that I did was with an international literacy organization called Room to Read. Um, that does 
has publishing efforts in countries across the world. Um, so the project I worked on with them was developing 10 picture books on climate change developed in 10 different countries. Oh my god! These were uh, photo illustrated um, expository nonfiction. And we had a, a team, like a country officer in each country, and then a, a writer that they hired within each country. And that was fascinating because, you know, it was working with people in these different contexts. They were in um, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Um, yeah. And even just one thing I learned in the process is that like even the concept of nonfiction doesn't exist in the same way in different places. Really? Um, wow. And what does it mean to write for children? Is the government involved? Like in some countries for children's books to be published, they need to be basically signed off by the government. Um, yes. You know, yes. so there were all these kind of pieces at play. Yeah. I mean, at least in the U S things have gotten better um, over the last yeah. A yeah. few years, I'd say, especially over COVID um, mm. and after the George Floyd murder, yeah. I think there was finally, I mean, there's always a sort of reckoning over time, but I, yeah. you know, yeah, for sure. we'll see how long it lasts. Um, yeah. I hope it does. But, mm. but my sense from having even worked in traditional publishing is that the way the market is seen, um, who the buyers are, who the important kind of people are. Um, it's a pretty closed system and mm, interesting. So for me personally, I've sort of stepped away from a lot of traditional publishing. I mean, I'm a little Berkeley radical kind of anti-capitalist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I found a way when I lived in New York, but I wasn't, it wasn't like a totally good match for me. Um, Children's book press is a nonprofit, which sort of started my sense of what is this, like, what is this project? was much more based on community needs. So we yeah. would go to conferences, especially with teachers and librarians, and they would say, oh, we love your books, but what we really need is, a, you know, a, a Filipino American, you know, more Filipino American books, because we have a lot of Filipino, Filipino American kids who don't get to see anything kind of reflected. Right. Stories that we have. right. And so Children's Book Press as a nonprofit was able to be responsive in that way. And then we yeah. would look for authors and artists and really try to work with people who came from the background that the story was from. Um, so that's sort of how I came into like, what does it mean to kind of publish responsive children's books? Then when I was in New York, you know, the, the influential kind of teachers or librarians um, were kind of deferred to uh, marketing was very much about kind of what do we think is going to sell? Um, yeah. Yeah, I ended up finding it not, it wasn't a great, it wasn't inspiring <laughs> to me. Yeah, I have one friend yeah. who, who came with me at the same time and ended up staying in publishing. And I remember at one point her saying, you would just hate it here because it's all about, you know, what's the brand? Like, it's not even about like, what's the story yeah. or the heart, you know, it's, it's like, how can we sell this? And I mean, sales are clearly part of it, but especially when you're thinking about children's books and the importance, you know, my friend Zed Elliott, who's a, fantastic author and she both self publishes and gets traditionally published but she wrote an article years ago called something it's a light like a, an open letter to the publishing industry a life or death um i can't remember how yeah. she kind of finished that but basically she said for for you know some kids actually seeing something that really speaks to them that reflects you it's know and it so doesn't important. have to be a literal reflection right i loved fairy tales and fantasy so she writes yeah. fantasy books yeah but they tend to be set in urban contexts with kids from different backgrounds that yep. like dragons in a bag starts with a kid whose mom is facing eviction. And so they respond to it. And then his, you know, there's, I think it's his, if it's his grandmother, godmother is a, is a witch and he ends up getting involved in this whole kind of, you know, wonderful traveling through fantasy space and getting these dragons and, you know, but she, she's taking on real things in life that are political, right. that are social, that are, you know, about yeah. race, that are about class. Um, so to me, where I'm the most excited is kind of the more uh, independent publishing, whether people are self-publishing, small yeah. publishers, micro-publishers. There's so much more possibilities for people to do it themselves yeah, and, and support each other in community. Yeah. 
So that's, so that's where I see the kind of real most exciting things happening personally. That is so cool. And so do you have, uh, you said you're the founder of the Manzanita Children's Book Community. So what is that actually? What is that? Yeah. About? It's so it's, it's, it's been slow growing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you know, you run community, like it's, it's, it's its own challenge. I had this idea in early 2023 and using the circle space, which is where you and I'm connected. Yeah. Um, when I found that kind of platform, I really liked how it works. And, and, you know, my, my goal is to support people who are creating their children's books. Um, All right especially grassroots community-based children's books for themselves and their communities. Um, so I have members getting it kind of growing and starting and, com you know, conversations flowing is, has been a challenge. Um, what I've decided to do is in January, I'm launching a cohort um, called the Create Your Children's Book Cohort. Nice. And that will be, I think, a more structured There'll be weekly teaching prompts. I'll do a mini lecture and some prompts for people to do kind of on their own, but then post and share with each other. We'll have weekly gatherings, online gatherings, which will be more a chance for people to talk to each other, ask questions, mm -hmm. support each other. I'll bring mm -hmm. in visiting speakers who are, Zeta being one of them, you know, indie children's book creators who have already been on the path, who can talk about their experiences and share what they've learned. Um, but I also want it to be a really responsive space to, to members. So there's other possibilities if people want them like writing cafes, you know, where you have a time and everybody just shows up and can write and support each other, this, you know, yeah. open mic nights to, to read out loud what you've done. Um, so it'll, it'll respond to kind of to member needs. Um, mm. And that's going to launch at the beginning of January. And actually I'm doing an inf information night for it, but this will be, this will, post after it <laughs> this coming yeah. a week from Wednesday, I'm going to be doing an information night about it. Um, yeah. Well, I know that we'll post after we, this, this podcast will come up, but send me that information and I'll, you know, show, I'll, I'll showcase that out there oh, thank as, you. A, as an upcoming guest in 2024, for sure. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Send me the details of both the cohort and the open night. I, I just, to me, I, well, I'm actually in, community building and I have the do brand new uh, membership community. It's all, and we have uh, something called do masters, which is our top tier. Our, our, our lower tier is actually the do book club. And the whole purpose is just to come together to have conversations. It is the best book club because you don't have to read the book. Oh. <laughs> the facilitator's job is to take a book that they want to have and then to create conversation point a diverse audience in the community is is for conversation and people love this and what i can say too uh, is that people in my community they 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 all there's a growing in, as aspiration to have their own communities and i i assist people with building their communities and the one thing i have learned and i learned it actually from someone in circle because I came on to Circle when they were still in beta, and then I started the community February 2021, is to start the core of it as a as a dinner club, hmm. and just and and I can tell you now I'll be celebrating three years uh, for the community opening. It's still small, but the engagement and the is so strong and it's so valuable mm -hmm. and the conversations are so amazing. Mm -hmm. And I've never worried about having a session and maybe only one or two people showing up because sometimes those are the best conversations. So mm -hmm. what you're doing is so incredibly valuable and I'm so inspired by what you're doing and to, to be able to give a, you're giving a voice to people around the world to share their stories in a way because yeah, they're going to have to go through, you know, they can't go through the main publishers because they're getting knocked back in their countries to go through main publishing. Mm -hmm. And it is this way and the support and the, and the reading of it. Um, I just wanted to share a quick story that it's, it's one of the reasons I do what I do today as well. And, I was doing my master's degree here in New Zealand back in 2010. 
and I was, it was in uh, education and online learning. So we were just exploring all of what we now exist today, like community online and everything and how this was going to play out as we began to create learning communities. And it was interesting because there was this story this one guy shared and he was he was living in England and he went on a holiday to India and he went to some rural places and he got to some villages where the one thing or the pain point he saw was that there were these children in villages schools that they they wanted to learn English but they they were learning English from their teachers who were speaking English as a second language he went back to the UK and this is about 2010 he met up with his grandmother, who was, his, was an, a widow, and her friends that were widows, and they sat alone in their rooms. He got this group of older women connected to computers, and he got those women to, to, be, to, to come to those classrooms and to read stories. Hmm. And it was amazing that these women were reading stories to these children in these places. So they were getting first English language, you know, lessons really through the storytelling. But mm -hmm. how amazing would that be to have that happening in our world where multicultural stories were just being kind of broadcast mm -hmm. you know, into these little pods around the world? Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, and there are like room to read has they've published i think over six thousand books all over the world and they have a platform i can't remember the name of it now but that you can go and and read the books that they're producing and wow. what's beautiful, you know, what they're doing is that they're producing them in these countries by people in the countries right so then yeah. you know you're actually getting to read stories that are coming you know in our our world it's been so tended to be so kind of one way right with like say American culture through Hollywood or, you know, but to, to get that, that much more diverse feel for, for the stories that are out there. Um, mm, that is so know. cool. Well, I'm going to ask you an obvious question. Well, not an obvious question, but a very interesting question. And that is, what is a book that you would recommend and, and why would you recommend that book? Hmm. A children's book, a book for adults? Either or both. How about both? <laughs> I mean, Zeta, who I've spoken about, is one of my favorite, favorite authors. I'm always kind of singing her praises. Um, the book I mentioned, Dragons in a Bag, which is a middle grade book, which is the first in, in her series, I think is fantastic. Um, and that was published by Random House. Uh, and she also publishes picture books um, that are beautiful. Her self-published books are fantastic. And people, you know, those are, are harder to come by. Um, yeah. I love... Uh, let's see, Mother of the Sea, I think is one that she wrote um, that is a kind of for slightly older readers with a child who's taken on a ship uh, to be enslaved and who ends up interacting with this sort of mermaid fierce figure who um, wow. it's, it's a heavy, beautiful story uh, for kids. Um, yeah. Uh, anything by Zeta, if you go to her, her website, which is just Zeta Elliott, and look at, you, you can't go wrong with any of her books. And she's got something for everyone, all ages. That's amazing. So make sure you, when you send me that email, that you include her and a couple of her books. And I'll okay. put that in the show notes, because I know there'll be people listening to this that'll want to grab a copy or check that out. Yeah. 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 She's and, one of I mean, I'm I'm part of a, a community of indie book creators. That's and Zeta yeah. and I met when I was at Lee and Lowe, but she and a couple of, of us meet on a monthly basis just to kind of support each other. That's um, fantastic. And then I'm part of another group that's organizes a social justice children's book holiday fair that's actually coming up December ninth. Um and that is also people who are self publishing books coming together and it's totally grassroots. It's volunteer run. You know, we yeah. find a place where we can do it. We're doing it at a school this year, which is great. So it'll be a playground. Cool. Kids can go play. And the school PTA is actually going to have their own fundraiser. So they're going to be selling baked goods and crafts. And so, you know, hopefully it's going to bring together, you know, the, the school community and then other people to, to, to buy books. And that way it's like people who don't necessarily have the the means, the time, the access right. in terms of promoting their books, getting them into bookstores, anything like that. 
Um, it's just a superpower way of being like, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to just pop it up and we're going to use our collective power with everybody yeah. saying the word. Um, yeah. But so we, li we, yeah, we live in such an amazing world that what that does is it creates a model and it inspires other people. And especially today when we can share those things on social media or wherever that this is what's happening. And if we do, like, as you share, give the little details of how it all came together. It inspires other people. And I'm sure that that will inspire other little, you know, events like that around the world. It's so incredible. Yeah. yeah we hope Amazing. so. I mean, that's, that's our thinking is like, it just took yeah. maybe five of us saying, yeah. let's do it. And let's then, it. you know, it's a fair amount of work, but it's, it's totally worth it. It's such a joy. And to yeah. have the day when the kids are coming and they're getting to interact with all these authors and, you know, I was at a, we did a, a variation on the fair kind of recently at an event and not just that, but I had a parent come who was saying she'd love to write stories, but she's like, oh, but I could never do it. You know, I could never publish. Yeah. You have to, you know, it's this kind of high on the hill thing, right? Like getting yeah. published just like this and, and to get to say to her, no, really, you, you no. can do it. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, seeing the kind of like, wow, it, it brings it down, right? It's very human. Yeah. Very human. We all have stories to tell. And, you know, depending on your goals, because I work with quite a few people who are self-publishing yeah. or, or who are writing books and then trying to figure out what their next step is going to be as an editor. Yeah. And usually what I'll say to them is, you know, kind of what are your goals in terms of figuring yeah. out what path you're going to try to take? Are you going to try to get traditionally published? Do you want to self-publish or somewhere in the middle, yeah. small publishers? Yeah. Um yeah. You know, traditional publishing brings a lot of advantages. They have the systems in place in terms of distribution, you know, getting awards, getting reviews, things like that are much easier if you're traditionally published. Getting into conferences, like the things that you can do to kind of make sure people know about your books. Um, but self-publishing or smaller publishers, you tend to have a lot more control. Um, you know, you can tell the story the way you want. I, yeah. I do encourage people, depending on your goals, you know, to get support. People are coming to me or coming for an editor. So right there, they're, you know, trying to, to make it the best book that they can, yeah. but they get to make the final decision. Um, That's it. And then, you know, you have to do all the marketing. You, have, you know, there's, a, there's, 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 there's so pluses much. and minuses. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, when I say doing brand you, it's, it's, you know, living that authentic human self and you brought that up as how human it is. And I mean, it is in our DNA as humans, when we want to live that best version is to create and, and what you're doing is offering people an opportunity to create from their authentic source of who mm -hmm. they are. And in a world where we're, where we've had this explosion really only in the last 10 years of, and really since COVID for the, the this kind of conversation happened regularly, uh, it was very, very new for the human race, for the, for our human history, for us to be able to, to be able to have these conversations. And it's exciting. I think what's, what's coming up and it's exciting that you're giving people that opportunity. We see it happening in art. We see it happening in music you know, people wanting to, to get out there and to share their, their stuff and, and it's working and we're going to see that evolve, I think a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we've almost, we've come to the, the 30 minutes, which is what we try to keep this to, but I have one more question to finish off and bring this kind of back full circle. And that is that you started talking about how you got into this children's books and the publishing and the writing and uh the activist type things and and it, you've talked about the, you know the collaboration you're doing within the community that you live it's vermont is it you're no, in vermont? I'm in berkeley i did go berkeley. to vermont i went to i did my mfa in vermont college of fine arts but no i live in but berkeley california you're, you're you're in berkeley okay and so and then yeah and then and then you also talk about this community on this online community that you're formed so how can you express and maybe just share, because I know people listening to this are interested in, in building their own communities and that, why is it that you've now had a pathway going into creating this community, being focused on collaboration? It's, you know, you're definitely not on your own. Your, 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 your path is moving to collaboration and community. And what is it that inspires you and what vision do you have for community? 
Mm, nice. Yeah, I mean, I think collaboration, community, creativity are sort of my three key right. like, things that have felt like they drive me. Um, mm. The sense that we're all connected, you know, that that mm. our health is and our well-being is dependent so on true. other people's um, yeah. and that we're stronger together and that it's going to take a lot of us to kind of keep this world <laughs> <laughs> you know, going or, you know, just the, the, and then the power of envisioning, you know, positive future yeah. possibilities. Mm-hmm. We're going to yeah. have to tell those stories to each other. Uh, right. We're going to have to recognize everybody's humanity. We're going to have to cross right. divides, right. And, and talk to each other. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, all of that inspires me. I'm learning all the time. Uh, you know, I'm inspired by the people around me all the time. Um, and I, I hope to just be able to help kind of hold the space to bring all these amazing people together to support me and each other, you know, that we're all in it together, trying to just work yeah. together towards that, the better world. Yeah, I just love that. It's, and it re- it will resonate with, you know, those, those that are listening here on the channel. So. Usually I ask uh what's a what's a good quote but actually I'm going to I'm going to share a quote because it's a quote that I've I haven't said it recently but it's one that I hold dear and it's invest in our children for they are our future. Mm. And you just embody that. You just <laughs> I'm so inspired <clears throat> by this conversation and by what you're doing and definitely there'll be all your connections down below in the show notes below so Check those out. Get in touch with what Laura's doing. Check out what she's doing. I hear you've got a sub stack so you can uh, going and a community to join and books to read. So a lot of connections to make with you. So thank you so much, Laura, for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's really been fun. <laughs>